household living standards are going Order. backwards. Senator Billick, you'll be in continuation when debate resumes. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I take before the information of the Senate a revised ministry list. I seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard and make a short statement. It's leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. Uh, I thank the Senate. Mr. President, I advise the Senate that the updated ministry list reflects the updated representing arrangements in the House of Representatives. Mr. President, um, I seek leave to make a statement regarding ministerial absences. Leave is granted. Senator Corbyn. Um, I advise the Senate that Senator Canavan will be absent from question time today, Monday 11 November 2019, for personal reasons. Uh, in Senator Canavan's absence, uh, Senator McKenzie will represent the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, the Minister for Regional Services, Decentralisation and Local Government, and the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. I further advise the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time today due to ministerial duties. In Senator Reynolds' absence, Senator Pine will represent the Minister for Defence, the Assistant Defence Minister, the Minister for Veterans and Defence Personnel, and the Minister for Defence Industry. Senator McKenzie will represent the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts. Yep, Mr. President, I seek a leave to uh, make a statement in relation to bushfires. Leave granted. Leave is granted. I thank uh, the Senate. Uh, Mr. President, as we gather today, uh, all of us are very mindful of the efforts and sacrifice of thousands of brave Australians who are responding to the ongoing bushfires in North East New South Wales and South East Queensland. Uh, let me update the Senate on the situation to date as well as the broader response of the government to the fires and their aftermath. In New South Wales, fires continue to burn across large parts of northeast New South Wales. As of this morning, there are more than 65 fires burning. More than 1,300 firefighters and support personnel, along with 78 aircraft, have been battling these fires. Tragically, three people have lost their lives and dozens more have been injured, including firefighters. The Rural Fire Service estimates 150 structures have been lost, including a large number of homes. Evacuation centres have been established. The Prime Minister yesterday met with some of the affected communities. Whilst conditions have eased in New South Wales over the weekend, we can't draw any comfort. Fire weather conditions are expected to worsen tomorrow. A total fire ban is in place across the entirety of the state. The Premier of New South Wales has declared a state of emergency across New South Wales. A catastrophic fire danger has been forecast for the Greater Sydney and Greater Hunter areas tomorrow. This is the first time such conditions have been forecast for Sydney since the new fire danger ridings were introduced a decade ago. Fires are also continuing to burn in South East Queensland. There are reports of property loss but no confirmation of numbers. The situation is ever-changing and a state of fire emergency has been declared across 42 local government areas. The dangerous fire weather conditions are expected to return on Wednesday for parts of South East Queensland. I should note we are also watching Western Australia with concern, where severe to extreme fire dangers are forecast to die over southern and central fire weather areas. The government is working very closely with, the state and territory, with our state and territory counterparts. I would like to acknowledge the tremendous national effort taking place with interstate firefighters travelling from the ICT, South Australia, Tasmania and Victoria. The Director General of Emergency Management Australia activated COMDIS plan on 31 October. Firebombing fire bombing aircraft have been in action against these fires and the RAAF have transported firefighters from Canberra, Adelaide and Hobart to Port Macquarie. In New South Wales, disaster recovery assistance is being provided under the jointly funded Commonwealth State Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements, and indeed uh, assistance is available for the mid-north coast bushfires in the northern New South Wales bushfires, and the northern New South Wales bushfires. The assistance available is extensive. The on-the-ground assistance is administered by the New South Wales Government, uh, with the Disaster Welfare Assistance Line uh, available on 1800 four. We are also providing additional financial assistance through the Australian Government Disaster Recovery Payment. Uh, this is a non-means-tested payment of $1,000 for eligible adults and $400 for children. It is available to those whose homes have been lost or directly damaged, who have been seriously injured or have an immediate family member of, or someone, uh, who has lost, of someone who has lost their life. 
The payment has been activated for the local government areas of Armadale, Clarence Valley, Glen Innes um, 7, Kempsey, Mid Coast, Nambuka, Port Macquarie, Hastings, Richmond Valley, Tenterfield and Walker. As well, the Australian Government's Disaster Recovery Allowance is a short-term uh, income support payment uh, to assist those who have experienced a loss of income as a direct result of the bushfires. The allowance has been activated for the local government areas of Armadale, Bellingham, Clarence Valley, Coffs Harbour, Glen Innes 7, Kempsey, Inverell, Mid Coast, Nambuka, Port Macquarie, Hastings, Richmond Valley, Tenterfield, Urala, and Walker. Both the disaster recovery payment and the disaster recovery allowance are administered by the Department of Human Services, and anyone adversely impacted by the bushfires in New South Wales should contact the Department of Human Services on uh, 180 The government is also in close contact with Queensland authorities in relation to the activation of disaster assistance. Assistance through the jointly funded DRFA can be made immediately by the Queensland government to help people in need. As soon as there is a better understanding of the on-the-ground situation, the Australian government with the state will provide whatever assistance is needed to help affected communities with their recovery. And Mr President, Australians can be confident that every part of the Australian Government stands ready to assist with what is before us. All Commonwealth agencies have been activated and are prepared to assist state authorities and the communities. This is particularly so in the case of the Australian Defence Force, whose full resources will be available to assist where they can. I can report to the Senate that the Minister for Defence has directed and authorised all local base commanders to provide immediate assistance wherever it is required in response to emerging circumstances. These are difficult days for many communities. No matter where we sit in this chamber, we are all in awe of the professionalism, bravery and dedication of our emergency services workers and volunteers. They have inspired us all. They embody the best of us. So on behalf of uh, the government and I'm sure the Senate, I also would like to express our thanks to the employers who have in their ranks emergency services volunteers. Thank you for your understanding. We know you're short-staffed, but thank you for supporting your staff as they support our community. It's vital in coming days that Australians follow the advice of the emergency services. Though heartbreaking, houses and gardens can be replaced, but family members can never be replaced. They just can't. Your safety is more important than any property or animal you might consider protecting. Please follow advice. Please be aware of your surroundings. Please take no chances. Whilst there are still difficult days ahead, we can draw strength from the way all our people are responding. As the Prime Minister has said, we are seeing Australians, helping Australians. We can be proud of our people and we are determined to do everything we can to help those same people get back on their feet. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. And on behalf of the Labor Party, I join Senator Cormann in expressing our condolences to those who have lost loved ones in these bushfires. And I pay tribute to the emergency personnel, to the volunteers, to all those who have shown such, shown such courage in their efforts to protect our fellow Australians. And I join Senator Cormann in urging all, of, all in affected areas to listen to warnings and to stay safe. As Mr Albanese made clear, both publicly and in his telephone call to the Prime Minister, Labor stands ready to work with the government and affected communities in any way we can assist. As at a short time ago, up to 60 fires were burning in New South Wales and in excess of 45 in Queensland, and unfathomable 970,000 hectares burnt in New South Wales and further 11,000 in central Queensland alone. Tragically, three of our fellow Australians have died. Many have been injured, including firefighters. But behind these numbers are our fellow Australians, Australians facing the most extreme circumstances, the most traumatic circumstances, Australians facing the loss of homes, and worst, worse still, Australians facing the loss of loved ones. And I again pause to express our sympathies to those loved ones of those who have lost their, lost their lives and to wish a speedy and full recovery to all who have been injured. 
In New South Wales, 150 homes have been destroyed, and in Queensland, over a dozen. And most horrifyingly, it appears the worst is yet to come, with deteriorating weather conditions predicted tomorrow. Western Australia and South Australia also facing serious threat. It is a national tragedy and a national emergency. And right now, today, there are families grieving, communities in danger, and courageous Australians fighting these fires. And we're with them and ready to support them in any way we can in this crisis. But I will say this. It is the responsible thing to do when we are through this current crisis to focus on what we have to do to keep Australians safe. When I was climate minister, scientists were already warning of longer and more intense fire seasons. Regrettably, these warnings have been proved correct. Individual weather events can't be directly linked, but trends can. And we need a plan to keep Australians safe by dealing with the risk of more extreme better event, uh, weather events. But today, we focus on the immediate crisis and those dealing with it. And the rallying of emergency personnel and volunteers, people coming together to support one another, the images we see on our televisions, the stories we hear on our radios, what we see on social media. At a time of trouble in the world, what we have seen in many ways is the best of Australia, the way in which we can come together. So I say to all of those who are impacted by facing the threat of this crisis, to all of those confronting it, I know we, I speak for all of us in this place, we stand with you. Thank you, Mr President. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I rise on behalf of the Australian Greens to speak to the bushfire and climate emergency that our nation is facing. And we share the sentiments that have been expressed already by the Leader of the Government and the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, and we too express our deep sorrow and grief at the lives lost, the homes lost and the habitat lost from these catastrophic bushfires. These are truly heartbreaking scenes. We are so grateful to the women and men putting their lives on the line to contain these unprecedented fires and all of the people supporting them right now. Our volunteer firefighters, our professional firefighters and all of our emergency service personnel are heroes. On the latest updates, three people have tragically died and over 150 structures and homes have been lost. There are still 47 fires burning in my home state of Queensland and a state of emergency has been declared in 42-odd local government areas. There are 60 fires uh, at least burning in New South Wales and the Premier there has also declared a bushfire emergency. And indeed, New South Wales fire authorities have issued their first ever catastrophic warning. What is unfolding is a direct threat to human lives and we extend our deep gratitude to all of those working around the clock to keep people safe. What is even more scary is the context in which these fires are happening. The New South Wales Rural Fire Service Commissioner, Shane Fitzsimons, has said that above normal temperatures and below average rainfall will continue to dominate the coming months. He said, we've got the worst of our fire season still ahead of us. We're not even in summer yet. It's truly terrifying to think that we haven't even entered the traditional bushfire season yet. Of course, our bushfire season is now fundamentally altered. Our bushfire season has extended to become almost an all-year round threat. For the first time, fires are raging in both the northern and southern hemispheres at the same time. The age of Australian firefighters helping out in California in our winter and vice versa are likely to be over. We cannot say we weren't informed that this was going to happen. In 2006, a report was handed to the Howard government by the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology that fire and extreme fire rating days would increase significantly by 2020. We're already in that future. They told us that the fire season would extend and the window for crucial prescribed burning would narrow. What Australian climate scientists predicted in 2006 has come to pass. And governments have had every opportunity to act and have failed. The question for us is whether this parliament will continue to fail those communities. Australia's greenhouse gas pollution right now is the highest on record. The mining and burning of coal and methane emissions from gas extraction continue to rise. The complete lack of climate policy in this country is simply pouring fuel on these fires, making them more likely and more intense. 
We owe it to our communities to rapidly transition to a renewable energy economy and unlock the thousands of new jobs in those communities. Thoughts and prayers are not enough to protect the Australian community from future megafires. We need science. We need action from government to rapidly drive down Australia's pollution and, in the process, create those tens of thousands of jobs across the country and keep our communities safe from drier, harsher conditions that are unfolding before our very eyes. This parliament should be doing everything within our power to minimise the risk of losing human life, property and habitat. And that means doing everything we can to stop a climate breakdown. If we in this parliament don't commit to doing this, then we'll be back here delivering another statement on another tragic national disaster with shorter and shorter gaps in between. The Australian Greens do not want statements like this to become frequent and regular. We want to see communities right across the country be safe from harm, and we commit to continue to doing and working for just that. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. As leader of the Nationals in the Senate, I stand with uh, other political parties to put our thanks uh, to our volunteers uh, on, on the record. We've had devastating fires that have brought, burnt across large parts of New South Wales and Queensland, claiming three lives, and our thoughts and prayers are with the families and loved ones who are so tragically affected. More than 30 people have been injured, including 20 firefighters. Our volunteers and paid responders, all professionals, continue to put themselves in harm's way to keep us safe. And in some cases, they've lost their own homes whilst they're out protecting others from the fires. Fires that are having a devastating impact on many communities, and the lion's share of these communities are represented by National Party MPs right across regional New South Wales and Queensland. And they're out there now on the ground doing what they can do to support their communities. Kevin Hogan and Michelle Landry, George Christensen, worried about Bowen, and our new Nationals member for Cowper, the Kempsey boy, Pat Conaghan, com his community has been through so much in the past week, uh, and it isn't over for them yet as they mourn the loss of life. David Gillespie in Taree is with his community, and Barnaby Joyce uh, and their community is grappling with the loss of life and the devastating impact on the Glen Innes community, which is actually the former home of uh, Senator Wacker Williams. Lou O'Brien up in Wye Bay is also heavily impacted in Queensland. This week, these MPs are able to be with their communities to do what they can for them, and it shows that in the midst of such hell, we've seen the very best of regional Australia stand up and support and aid their neighbours and friends. And I'm sure everyone in the Senate will join us in thanking them and appreciating their efforts. The Rotary Clubs, the Lion Clubs, the local branches of CWA, Red Cross, St Vincent's de Paul and Salvos are all providing what comfort they can. It isn't just the human toll. Community infrastructure, telecommunications and power infrastructure, bridges, schools, volunteer fire stations have been destroyed. More than 1,300 firefighters and support personnel, <coughs> along with 77 aircraft, have been battling these fires. <coughs> Evacuation centres have been established and remain active to support fire-affected communities. Our first concern is for the safety and needs of those directly affected. People need to stay alert as fire weather conditions are predicted to worsen again tomorrow and through the rest of the week. And we're also watching WA with concern. I urge everyone to stay aware of their surroundings and follow advice from local emergency management authorities. If you're asked to leave by our authorities for your safety, leave. Our government has made assistance available as quickly as we can. Minister David Littleproud has already acted to provide assistance both to support the front line and to provide financial assistance to individuals and communities. We can, will continue to support disaster-affected communities and stand ready to provide further assistance as required. It's because it's the right thing to do and it's because we're part of these communities. We're experiencing the shock, horror and exhaustion of the fires with our communities uh, and we're wishing everyone the very best over the coming week. Thank you. We'll move to questions without notice and I'll call Senator Green. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Regional Development, Senator McKenzie. Last Saturday's Cairns Post quoted <coughs> Member for Leichhardt's office as saying, and I quote, the department was solely responsible for assessing, recommending and ultimately awarding grants under the RJIP program. Can the minister confirm that this statement is not true? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Regional Development, Senator McKenzie. 
me. Um, the RGIP program, uh, I understand the senator is asking about, and I do apologise I haven't got those details to hand, um, and I haven't seen the article that you're quoting. I'm very happy to come back on notice uh, and actually give you the details you're seeking. Order. Senator Green, a, supplement, a supplementary question. Thank you. The electorate of Leichhardt was awarded $16.2 million in the tropical North Queensland round of the RJIP program, but Kennedy was awarded only $1.9 million. How many applications in Kennedy were recommended by the department but overturned by the ministerial panel? And how many applications in Leichhardt were approved by the ministerial panel against advice from the department? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you, Senator. As to the details of applications received, recommended and approved, I can get those details for you on notice. But the Australian government, just in response to the ANAO uh, uh, report, we note the findings of the ANAO's performance audit report on the award of funding under this program and the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Cities and Regional Development has accepted the recommendations of the report, having already implemented improved practices that address Order. these recommendations based on the findings of an insurance review proactively conducted by the department in July 2018. Order. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Thank you. One of the programs referred to in that order, audit includes a grant in Leichhardt um, for $2.4 million to a company part owned by the wife of the member for Leichhardt's former campaign manager, who was also the chair of the Tropical North Queensland RGIP Planning Committee. The company has since decided not to proceed. Why has the ministerial panel not reallocated the funds to a different Tropical North Queensland application? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Senator, for your question. I will take the details on notice and get back to you. But the regional jobs and investment um, packages help diversify regional economies, they stimulate economic growth, and they deliver sustainable employment in regional communities right across the country. It's a program uh, that has Order. made a great deal of difference in regional communities to ensure that we're uh, backing them, we're backing uh, the ec their economic stimulation and through that program. Now, the ANAO report acknowledges for an investment of $220.5 million in grant funding, the program has leveraged an estimated additional $467.8 million in project costs to support projects to drive ec economic growth in regional Australia. So it's been very, very useful uh, in leveraging local dollars and nows and providing jobs across regional communities. Order. Before before I come to the next question, I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber of the honourable Maria Didi, Minister of Defence of the Republic of the Maldives. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, to the Senate. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Water, Resources, Drought and Rural Finance, Senator McKenzie. Can the minister please outline how the Liberal and Nationals government is providing stability and certainty with its new support measures to assist drought-hit farmers and particularly small businesses and rural towns. The Minister representing the Minister for Water Resources Drought, Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, as you know, this drought uh, is showing no signs of uh, halting, and our government has chosen to stand with our drought-affected farmers and their communities from the very, very beginning, from the drought summit last year, where all premiers across this country came to Canberra, and as a, as a Commonwealth, we actually started towards agreeing how we're going to support our farmers. We were able to make up to more than seven billion dollars worth of commitments to our farmers, and focusing on assisting them right now, in the here and now, our front line, the farming communities and their families, Order. and then making sure that drought-affected communities are supported as the drought continues, because it is not just our farming families that end up affected, it is actually our rural supply stores, 
the employment in these local uh, areas. So supporting those uh, drought-affected communities with much-needed economic stimulus. We've got, we announced last week a uh, $200 million drought-only round of the BBRF, doubling the Roads to Recovery funding for these councils so that they can employ locals, so that they can purchase uh, the products for these projects from the local hardware stores and keep that money spinning through regional communities and keep people employed. Because when when the businesses dry up, when the cash dries up, people leave town and they do not come back. Over the weekend, I was in Moree, and the mayor there, Katrina Humphreys, talked about the impact on the whole community. She's a small business owner, and I tell you what, Moree, it is, it is like a, the moon landscape. It is incredibly dry. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. And for her then to be talking that it's not just about— it's one, usually one of the most productive agricultural regions in the country. And now uh, they're facing year on year of hardship and it's affecting the towns. Uh, spoke to Cole, who runs the local motorbike store. He's looking at laying people off if he cannot get the support required. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. And can the minister also update the Senate on the existing measures which support farmers and communities affected by drought? Senator Mackenzie. Well, when I was speaking to Cole in Moree, he actually thought the loan, uh, the new package of loans for small businesses in drought-affected communities, was exactly the type of product that would help him get through the drought and into the recovery. Would mean he could keep his 20-plus employees on board. He would be able to refinance any existing debt that he had and save tens of thousands of dollars in interest payments. The reality is. As soon as farmers have got that, uh, the crop in or are restocking, that is when the money will return to these communities. And so the small businesses are very, very appreciative. Why that's part of the drought support package is because that's what we've all heard when we've actually been out talking to drought-affected communities and farmers. This is exactly the type of response uh, that our communities wanted. We, as I said, we've got the economic stimulus, we've radically simplified the farm household allowance, and there's legislation before the Senate this week that will assist. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. How is the Liberal and Nationals in government building resilience against future droughts, and is the minister aware of any alternative approaches? Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, we are supporting our farmers and rural communities prepare and plan for drought. And we hear a lot of harping from other people that somehow we're not actually doing that. Reality is, we're the first government that, who's going through a drought to actually put real money on the Order. table, real policy focus, to start preparing for the next one. Because guess what? We're Australians. This will not be the last drought. So we have Order. the Future Drought Fund, which will see $100 million Order. helping us to prepare Senator for the next one. Senator uh, we've also put a $1 billion into water infrastructure projects for storages, and we want state governments to actually come on the journey with us, build these much-needed dams and pipelines to drought-proof as much as we can our regional communities and our productive capacity. So that is actually how you plan for a drought. You plan for the next one now. We're the first government in our nation's history to actually do that. And instead Order, of harping, Senator McKenzie, get time for the answer has expired. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Regional Development, Senator McKenzie. The Auditor General's scathing report into the regional jobs and investment packages revealed ministers gave four projects ex exemptions from the 50 per cent co-funding requirements worth over $1.74 million, including $365,000 for a food van on Flinders Island in Tasmania without a cent from the proponent. What evidence did ministers rely upon in awarding this grant and co-funding exemption? Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Senator Urquhart, for your question. Uh, I'll have to take the details of that on notice um, and actually check with ministers concerned. But I've already stated to previous questions the Australian government notes the findings of the ANAO performance audit on the awarding of funding under this particular program. The department's working proactively to address uh, issues. 
And despite assertions being made and the cherry picking of certain sections of the ANAO report, it's actually worth apparently noting it uh, that there, the ANAO report concluded that there was no bias evident in the assessment and decision making process concerning funding of projects in RGIP regions over others. The regional jobs and investment packages, as I said, develop much, uh, deliver much needed funds to regional communities to actually stimulate employment, not just into the future but in the here and now. Now, in respect to requests for specific project details, uh, it's all publicly available uh, on the website. Order, Senator Watt. Senator Urquhart, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The food vans proponent told the Launceston Examiner. The approved project was originally a physical cafe and community centre, and the viability of the enterprise is questionable. What steps has the government taken to ensure this $365,000 grant for a food van represents value for money? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Urquhart, as I've said, I'll take the details of that particular project on notice. Um, but I can, and that's all I can really do um, in terms of, well, it's true. That is all I can do. So I, I endeavour to get back to the senator as soon as possible. Senator Urquhart, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I note that since the audit was released, the Deputy Prime Minister has refused to provide an explanation. How can the Deputy Prime Minister have full confidence that all projects awarded under the regional jobs and investment programs represent value for money. Senator McKenzie. Well, Senator, it is a rigorous process. The ANAO report in its entirety, in its entirety, actually makes some helpful suggestions, which the department has taken on board. Uh, and rather than cherry picking certain sections, Order. the actual conclusion of the report was there was no bias evident in the assessment and decision making process concerning fundings of projects in RGIP regions over others. That is what the report found. Now, could processes improve the departments uh, you know, looking at that and, and I'm getting more information at hand. Um, in selecting each of the ten regions, the government considered a range of factors, including recent structural changes Order. in the local economy Order. and whether or not the regions were under pressure from falling commodity prices and the downturn in the mining and manufacturing sectors. In each region, we had local planning committees develop local Order. investment plans that provided economic— Order on my left. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Today, 11 November, marks Remembrance Day. Can the minister please advise the Senate on the importance of commemorating those who have served and died in wars, conflicts and peacekeeping operations? The minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Scar for his question. As he has reminded us, today we mark Remembrance Day, the day on which we acknowledge the more than 102,000 men and women who tragically died during or as a result of warlike service non-warlike service and through peacekeeping operations. Originally known as Armistice Day, today marks the day that those guns fell silent on the Western Front during the First World War on the 11th of November 1918. We had a population of around 4.5 million people at the time, and some 416,000 of those enlisted for service in the First World War. Tragically, over 60,000 of them would not return from the war. And the Allied nations first observed two minutes' silence in honour of those who died and suffered during the war at 11 a.m. on November 11, 1919, a hundred years ago today. From villages, towns and, of course, our state capitals, no corner of Australia was untouched by this war or those that have followed. The names of our war dead are listed on the Roll of Honour at the Australian War Memorial. We have all seen them. We have all touched them. We're one of the few countries in the world that know the names of all our military personnel who died in war. Mr. President, the freedoms that we enjoy, the confidence we have that we can peacefully pursue our lives, have not come without cost. We must remember 
those 102,000 always, not just to honour them, but to fully appreciate what we have, mm -hmm. lest we forget. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. I thank the minister. Can the minister advise the Senate how the Australian community will be marking Remembrance Day? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, of course, Australians in communities around the nation commemorate Remembrance Day each year, from the young to the old. And I, with other ministers and senators, the Leader of the Opposition and members of the, of the House, and with the Minister of Defence and the Governor-General, ex-service organisations, current serving defence members, veterans, their families, members of the community joined today to mark Remembrance Day and our National Cemetery at the Australian War Memorial. And we know that these Remembrance Day ceremonies occur across every state and territory capital and in communities right across the country, where people gather at their local cenotaph, now 100 years old in many, many cases, and show their respect for those who've served and died in our defence forces. As we all paused for a moment's silence today and displayed, as we do in the chamber this afternoon, our red poppies, I know that we all reflected on a time that military service has affected our own lives in one way or another, and we honoured those who have given so much for us. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate what our Australian Defence Force personnel deployed around the world will be doing to mark this important day? Senator Payne. Mr President, no matter where they are, no matter in what role they are serving, I know that Australian Defence Force personnel will take part in Remembrance Day services on bases, at public shrines and memorials around Australia, as well as around the world. Because we have more than 2,000 Australian Defence Force personnel serving on operations around the world uh, who will also pause at that moment. They're deployed to operational theatres where they will be involved in commemorations, either conducted by Australian contingents or indeed as part of coalition forces. They are immensely powerful experiences, Mr President, as coalition forces come together to join in acknowledgement of the armistice and now of Remembrance Day. Our personnel are, of course, serving Australia's national interests around the world, whether it's across the sea, the land or the air domains. And I know that all those in our chamber join me in acknowledging the men and women of the ADF on this day and thanking them for their service. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. My question is to Minister Mackenzie, representing the Minister for Natural Disasters and Emergency Management. Bushfire victims are suffering from the climate crisis. It's not just 11,000 global scientists telling us about the climate emergency we're in. Affected mayors, rural fire service captains, and bushfire survivors themselves are all being reported making the clear link between these intense bushfires and the climate crisis. Will you acknowledge this link? Or do you agree with the Nationals' leader, Minister McCormack, that climate change is only the concern of raving inner-city lunatics? The Minister representing order. The Minister representing the Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Senator McKenzie. Order. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, Senator Waters, we do this dance, and usually it's with Senator De Natale, so it's lovely to have a different partner today. But um, I don't know how often I can stand in this place and actually say I accept the science of climate change. Our government does. We have got an, uh, we've got a suite of initiatives across all portfolios to actually bring down and reduce emissions. And I'm happy to go to uh, the initiatives in my own portfolio as Agriculture Minister, which takes climate change seriously and takes getting our emissions down seriously. So we can, we can do that dance. We know that climate change is causing heat waves, fire weather and drought and that to become more frequent and intense. We know that. Uh, so that's why we've got a raft of measures across our government to actually deal with this. We're going to um, see sea levels rise. We're going to see a whole suite of changes across our continent. And that is why we're going to keep our international commitments and reduce our emissions. $3.5 billion of our Climate Reductions Fund to give practical measures to help small businesses and communities lower their emissions 
and to do their bit. And to come in here day after day as if somehow uh, my response will change, it actually won't change. Uh, from agriculture's perspective, uh, we're looking at how we can assist in soil degradation. Uh, land care movement is playing a frontline role in assisting our environment to, and our farmers to adapt. Even last uh, a couple of weeks ago at the AgMins conference, all of Australia's agriculture ministers actually put forward a climate action around agriculture. And I recommend you actually read that document before standing up here and you know, somehow using the misery of those who are in regional New South Wales and Queensland Order. to your political Senator advantage. McKenzie. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Earlier this year, over 20 former fire chiefs and fire experts wrote to the Prime Minister warning of catastrophic fire risk because of the climate crisis and saying that Australia's services were unprepared, including in relation to water bombers. They asked to meet with the Natural Disaster and Emergency Management Minister and the Prime Minister, but they were fobbed off. And in fact, this morning they were insulted by Minister McCormack on national radio. Minister, why is the government ignoring these and other experts? And when will your government apologise to the people of New South Wales and Queensland Order, who Senator are facing Waters, these time fires? For the question has expired. Senator McKenzie. Um, look, you've asked what our government is doing to prepare for and reduce the effects of climate-related natural disasters. And we are investing $130.5 million to deliver disaster, the risk reduction initiatives at a national, state order. and local Senator level. McKenzie, Senator Waters on a point of order. Yes, thanks, President. With respect, I ask specifically uh, when the government is going to apologise to people facing Senator these catastrophic Senator Waters, fires um, Senator and why Senator Waters, you didn't take that meeting. Stop Please stop it while I'm, you, were, you were repeating part of the question that came after the time well, for the question like expired. An and yeah. please cease talking when I'm making a ruling. You didn't ask all of that question within the allotted time. I will, all right, and I, and I'll, I apologise in advance if I wasn't, but I was taking notes. And part that's the, the, because you went over the time limit, the minister is entitled to answer that part of the question that was asked. Senator McKenzie. Um. You know, I'm very, very happy to put on the record how seriously our government is uh, treating climate change and its impact when it comes to disasters, natural disasters. As I was saying, $130.5 million to meet the need for authoritative climate and disaster risk information. We've got pilot projects in supply chain and freight sector to be completed in 2019. We've published tools to support all decision makers to take better account of disasters when they make decisions that affect our communities across all sectors of society. And we've got the Australian Disaster Preparedness Framework for Severe to Catastrophic Disasters, which is a set of framework uh, that we work uh, with with others to actually ensure it rolls out Order, and Senator our McKenzie, communities are supported. The answers expired. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. Back in 2006, under Prime Minister Howard, Syro and the Bureau advised government that extreme fire, writing, fire days would increase by up to 25 per cent by 2020. And here we are. You can't say you weren't warned. Why is the Morrison government doing everything in its power to make these sorts of catastrophic fires more likely? By your climate denial and inaction, Senator McKenzie. Well, again, Senator Waters, I don't know how often I can stand up, and I've stood up for eight years and said the same thing. Here we go again. You know what? I know it doesn't suit your political purposes to have a coalition government that accepts the science of climate change. I know that doesn't suit you. It makes all things a little, little tricky. Uh, but we've got real money on the table to support our communities to reduce emissions and to do our bit as a responsible global partner to reach our Paris targets. And for you to come in here and politicise the misery that is actually going on in there and as if somehow we're not doing anything, again, very, very, very happy to go to uh, what, our, what our government is doing. I mean, bushfire, yes, climate change. There are other recommendations made by state governments around you know, land management practices. How do we actually access uh, water at a time of need? What about that? Order, burns Senator and fire McKenzie, breaks? time for the answers expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, my question is to the Minister Order. representing the Minister for Drought, Senator McKenzie. Departmental officials told estimates on the 21st of October 
that Moira Shire met the rainfall threshold but missed the employment threshold by 0.1 per cent for the Drought Communities Program. Ten days later, Nationals MP for Nichols, uh, Damien Drum, announced that Minister Littleproud has used ministerial discretion to declare the Shire eligible. Why did the people of Moira find out last night that they are in fact still not eligible? Order. The Minister representing the Minister for Water Resources Drought, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And, uh, I thank the Senator for her question and for her interest in drought-affected communities and, and regional Victoria in particular. The Drought Communities Program uh, is an incredibly popular program where a million dollars is provided to over 122 councils who are drought affected across the country. It's been going uh, for a couple of years and there's been three rounds thus far. Uh, it uses measurements such as rainfall and agricultural employment to determine eligibility, uh, amongst another, a raft of other measures. And uh, councils then, if they're uh, successful in attaining the drought community program uh, eligibility, then they can put forward projects to stimulate their local economy. Anything from doing up the local hall, uh, building a road. Some councils in South Australia have actually decided to employ drought support officers, uh, yes, stimulating local, uh, local employment, but also making sure that that local community has a dedicated person to look after uh, the needs in the drought. So it's been an incredibly popular program. We've expanded it uh, under our new drought response to order. include an additional Senator, six Senator councils. McKenzie, um, Senator Walsh, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. Point of order on, re on relevance. Uh, the question was why did the people of Moira find out last night that they are not eligible for this program? Um, I note the minister has provided some general context about the program, and she has 45 seconds remaining to come to the specifics of the question, as you've highlighted, Senator Walsh. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, when it, when, with respect to the specifics of the conversation you're, and advice you're speaking about last night, I'll have to take that on notice, and I endeavour to do that. Well, I'm not in the room, Senator Wong, through you, Mr. President, um, to actually have an appreciation of that. But I think the Senate knows that when I say I'm going to uh, get get back to you, I always do. So the methodology, as I've outlined takes into account uh, agricultural employment and also rainfall data. And it's an incredibly popular program. So we gave those uh, councils, 122 councils last week who were already recipients of Drought Communities Program funding. We'll get an Order, additional Senator amount McKenzie, of money. Time for the answers expired. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Nationals MP for Nichols, Damien Drum, is qu quoted in today's Herald Sun as saying, and I quote, we were expecting a little bit of ministerial discretion. I should have kept my mouth shut. What advice was provided by the Drought Minister or his office to the member for Nichols on or before the 31st of October to support his announcement? Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, Senator, for your question and to the specifics on the advice provided by Minister Littleproud to Damien Drum. I'll take that on notice. But, but. Can I say, can I say that our drought announcement last week that focused on frontline support for farmers, ensuring that those regional towns that are going to be so important for the recovery once the rains do come, hold on to their local employment, see money stimulated through their hairdressers, their IGAs and their rural supply stores. This program is key to keeping them in town, their families in town, their kids in school, because Order. This, so we're recognising that is why last week there is now an additional component to the DCP. You might have missed it as you flicked through our drought announcement. $50 million for drought affected councils, which will be at the minister's discretion to use and appoint. And I know Minister Littleproud is developing those guidelines uh, as we speak. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. The Mayor of Moira Shire, Moira Shire said today, and I quote, you can't announce something and then not do it. Yeah. 
As the Morrison government has failed the people of Moira so badly, how can Australians have any confidence in your ability to support the nation through this drought? Senator McKenzie. Well, as, uh, over, since the drought announcement on Thursday, I've met with Northern Territory uh, cattlemen in the Barclay talking about their dry times. Order. Well, I've also been speaking to farmers in Victoria, in South Australia, in Queensland and in New South Wales. been on the ground in these communities for the last Senator three White. days, listening to them, acting and taking up the things they need to be done. That's what our government's done. We've actually uh, talked to people. We actually know what these communities want to see. They want cash uh, on the table of our farmers. They want their regional towns supported through the drought, so their rural supply stores, so the skill sets are still there when the rain comes and we need to ramp up productivity. And our communities, such as Moira, Moyne, uh, you know, Kempsey, you name it, 122 councils plus another six and 50 more using the ministerial discretion will be supported by our drought announcement. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Minister, your department released an exposure draft on, of the Competition and Consumer Industry Codes Dairy Regulation 2019 in the last week of October. The exposure draft differs dramatically from the earlier draft clauses for a dairy code workshopped with dairy farmers in early 2019. In particular, there is a new provision, circumstances beyond the control of the milk processor, which permit unilateral price reductions in milk contracts contrary to the recommendation of the ACCC. Would the minister explain? please explain how the new provision concerning circumstances outside the control of the processor came to be put into the exposure draft. The Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Yes. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson, for your question. And, uh, our government is taking credible action to support our dairy farmers, and we've been doing that since day Order, one. Order, Senator since day Watt. One. Uh, when, when Fonterra and MG clawed back, clawed back money from dairy farmers, it was the National Party in government, Barnaby Joyce was the Ag Minister at the time, called dairy industry to Melbourne, and I was actually in the room. And we got the ACCC inquiry up and going. One recommendation of that, one recommendation. Anyone in this room that thinks a dairy code is going to solve every problem for the dairy industry in this country is kidding themselves. It is one part of a suite of initiatives to actually support this industry. Right now, we have historically high dairy prices, but not, it, our dairy farmers are doing it tough because they have incredibly high input costs. Electricity in your home state, Senator Hanson, for this perishable product is controlled by the Palaszczuk Labor government. So that, go and knock on their door for that one. Water prices for those of us that have uh, irrigated dairy country incredibly uh, high cost of input, and the drought has order. driven the cost Senator, of fodder Senator through McKenzie, the roof. Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. I have Senator Hanson on a point of order. Senator I'm Hanson. listening to the explanation, but my, my question was the, the new provision concerning circumstances outside the control of the processor, how did it come to be put in the exposure draft? That's all I want to know. Senator how Hanson, did that get um, into the question? Senator Hanson, you've reminded the minister of part of your question. The minister is allowed to be directly relevant to any part of the question, and in my view, a discussion of the code that you referred to in your preamble does make her answer directly relevant. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And so we took to the election as a government a commitment to deliver a mandatory code for the dairy industry to address the egregious behaviour of processors to farmers. And we know that it's not the only issue. Now, prior to the election. Uh, the eight dairy regions in this country were heavily consulted through two consultations. We had, uh, and right across the country, and not just our dairy farmers, but the whole supply chain. And what the, the draft exposure draft of the code that is before the, the public now is actually a result of how those nine principles were consulted out with the dairy industry more broadly. So. It is not the end game here. That's why we are out talking Order, to industry Senator and— Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Minister, you didn't even answer the question because you don't know the answer to it. 
The exposure draft that was drawn up in a, in a matter of days has been widely criticised as poorly written, with concerns about who actually wrote it. If my assumptions are not correct, can you assure the Senate that the exposure draft in its current form is the same as the one provided to you by the Office of Parliamentary Counsel? If not, who made the changes? Senator Mackenzie. Uh, Senator Hanson, the Department and the Department of Parliamentary Counsel drafted the code on the basis of the consultations undertaken prior to the election. Full stop. Full stop. There were no revisions in my office. There was nothing. So you can rest assured that the consultations with the processors, with the dairy farmers across eight very specific and unique dairy regions in this country, all come to uh, bear in the code that is out for exposure draft now. And I am rapt to see people engaging with this process. I'm speaking to farmers in WA. Order. Who... Senator Hanson, on a point of order. Point of order. The minister is not answering the question. I asked, is it the same exposure draft that was well, drawn Senator, up Senator previously? Hanson, that was Senator pre Hanson, there's opportunities to debate. There was no debate. definite. There was... there, Senator Hanson, I'll remind all senators, a point of order is not simply a chance to ask or re-ask a preferred part of the question or to simply re-ask it. It must relate to whether the answer is being directly relevant. I've been listening carefully to the minister, and I believe she was being directly relevant to answering about the preparation and release of the code that you asked about. Senator Mackenzie. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr President. And sorry, Senator Hanson, I've, I forgot you're actually new to this issue, so you probably don't appreciate the history. So why don't I walk you through pre-election on the dairy code development? So, as I said, departmental officials visited eight regions. The first round of consultation was in late 2018, and it identified views. Then we went out again. Order, Senator uh, McKenzie. January time to February. for the answers expired. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Still, I don't get a direct answer, and I do, either do the people of Australia and the dairy industry. The exposure draft shifts the financial risk from milk processors, who are mostly and many foreign owned to Australian dairy farmers. Why? Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. The National Party has been at the forefront of changes to competition and consumer law for decades. It is something we take very, very seriously. It is why we were the party that developed the Sugar Code, and we are also the party that has promised to bring forward a mandatory dairy code because we back our farmers and we also appreciate that when they don't have market power against processors, against retailers, uh, that sometimes you need to govern that relationship. It is our party. This is something we do uh, in the normal course of business, and that is exactly what we're doing. Now, we've consulted, as I said, excessively. The draft code is an expression of those consultations. It is now out there to hear from industry, and I'm getting direct feedback into the department from right across Australia on what changes we can make to the code so that it is the right code. It's got to be Order, the right Senator code McKenzie. for all our dairy farmers. Time for the answers expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister advise the Senate what measures the government has been delivering to support older Australians? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Van, for the question. Uh, and just on indulgence, Mr President, I'd like to acknowledge the tremendous effort that's gone into ensuring that 140 residents uh, were safely evacuated from Karamar Hostel aged care facility on Friday the 8th of November. These senior Australians took refuge at the evacuation centre from the bushfires, their local library and nearby facilities at Kabara Hostel and the Arcare um, facility. They were able to return to their home yesterday, the sun, uh, Sunday the 10th of November, and I know that uh, other facilities had prepared themselves ready to evacuate as well as in, uh, including Japara and Noosa. Uh, and I'd like to particularly thank the tremendous work of staff, volunteers, families and emergency workers and senior Australians themselves for the part they've played in responding so well to such a difficult time. Uh, back to your question, Senator Van, uh, and I acknowledge your interest in issues aged care. Our government 
Mr. President has been investing more than ever before to support older Australians. But we recognise, following the re release of the interim report of the Royal Commission, that additional investment will be required to ensure that all Australians have access to high-quality care as they age. It's worth noting, Mr. President, that when uh, th those opposite left office, funding for aged care was at $13.3 billion, and it's growing every year, Mr. President, from close to uh, $22 billion this year to over $25 billion at the end of the forward estimates. We know that senior Australians are increasingly choosing to remain in their own, own homes longer, and the government is committed to supporting this choice. Aged care packages uh, have increased from 60,308 under Labor in 2012-13 uh, and will grow to 157,154 in 2022-23 under the current settings, an increase of 161 per cent. Over the same Order, period, Senator Mr. President, Colbeck. Senator Van, supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister please update the Senate on the progress of the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety? <coughs> Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as you would all know, Mr. President, the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety handed out its substantive interim report on the 31st of October 2019. And I would, at this point in time, Mr. President, like to pay tribute to, particularly to Commissioner Richard Tracy, whose work the report predominantly was, and tragically he passed away after a very, very short period of time with um, a very aggressive cancer recently. Uh, but that report is largely his work, and I would acknowledge the work that he did on the report, uh, because it is a significant one and important for Australia's uh, older Australians. Establishing the Royal Commission, Mr. President, was one of the Prime Minister's first decisions as new, the new leader of the government. As the PM said at the time, we had to brace ourselves for some difficult stories arising from the Royal Commission, and, Mr. President, clearly that's occurred. The interim report of the Royal Commission has put us all on notice. Put us all on notice. It's put governments on notice. It's put providers on notice, and it's put the community on notice. Uh, we must all learn from the stories that are in the report, Mr. President. Order. We Senator must confront Colbeck, them honestly. Time for the answers expired. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline measures that the government has undertaken to improve aged care since the Prime Minister called the Royal Commission? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, our track record in improving uh, aged care since the Royal Commission is extensive. We've done a lot. We've Order. invested $2.2 billion Mr. President, into home care packages. We've released 14,275 new residential care packages. We've established the new Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. We've implemented new consumer-focused uh, aged care quality standards and put in place a new single charter of aged care rights. Mr. President. We've implemented new provider requirements to minimise physical and chemical restraint, and there's further work to do on that. And we've introduced a new mandatory national quality indicator program and provided uh, $21 million for research into 13 research projects that were focused on re risk redu reduction, prevention, tracking of dementia, uh, which is now Australia's second leading cause of death. Order. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> My question is to Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Last month, Minister, uh, you told farmers struggling with years of drought that, and I quote, a one-off drought relief payment of up to $13,000 for a farming family and up to $7,500 for an individual is designed to help uh, people determine whether they will be sustainable, should look at succession options or, in some instances, choose to sell. Minister, do you stand by your statement that the drought relief payment is a one-off payment and farmers should look to sell? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Stirl. The radical uh, expansion and simplification of the farm household allowance was as a result of a farmer-led review into the payment. Now, you, uh, like those of us over here that represent uh, rural electorates, know that the farm household allowance application process was very complex and uh, essentially too long. 
We've cut that down by over a third, and um, we've made substantial changes to, to, the, pro, to the, the paperwork. But one of the things the farmer-led review actually suggested was that rather it be a payment for four years in a lifetime of hardship for a farmer, that it be changed to four years of payment over 10 years, a 10-year period, recognising that in a country like Australia, farmers will go through more than one period of hardship in their life. Uh, we've accepted that recommendation. We've also accepted uh, all of the recommendations made by the review, and as such, we estimate uh, over 30,000 farmers uh, and their families who currently are not rece in receipt of this payment but potentially could be, uh, will become eligible. So part of the problem with farmers accessing this much needed support uh, is, is that they self-assess and think they're not going to make it. So I urge farmers to have a crack with their rural financial councillor. With respect to uh, the legislation before the Senate uh, this week, the lump sum payment of $13,000 that you speak is for this financial year. Um, 13,000 for a couple, seven and a half uh, for a single farmer. Bearing in mind, 80% of farmers are partnered, um, and the legislation also contains a rule where I'll be able to make a rule uh, going forward for additional lump sum payments when and where they're required. And I've made it very public uh, that I commit to do that. As long as the drought goes, uh, we'll be standing with our farmers. Order, and Senator them. McKenzie. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. Yeah, I, I do, Mr. President, and I do look forward to finding out if the minister believes the farmers should sell out. Um, so, Minister, when will drought affected farmers receive the one-off lump sum payment? Can you please let the Senate know the specific date? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you, uh, Mr President. Well, Senator Stirl, uh, through you, Mr President, I want them to receive it as soon as possible. So we can't get that done till it's legislated. And, and that's our job as a Senate this week, to get this legislation passed so we can get royal assent and we can actually get this payment uh, out to farmers. So as soon, I'm hoping we can get this done by the end of the year. Uh, if, our, if the Senate gets behind the ledge, uh, we're ready to go behind the scenes to get this uh, payment able to be applied. With respect to your, um, I'm very happy to reinforce what I've always said and what the National Farmers Federation have said and what you know, Ag Force has said and the VFF have said is that um, farmers are businessmen and women and they need to make decisions. And sometimes that is about selling up and getting out. Sometimes is it about changing how I farm or how my business is structured to make it more profitable. Sometimes it's about saying, you know what, I'm succession planning and the next generation can have a crack. These are Order. valid decisions. Senator McKenzie, time for the answers expired. Senator Stirl, a final supplementary question. I do. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, what advice would you have for farmers struggling with no financial assistant, assistance because of the Morrison government's decision to cut farmers off the farm household allowance? Senator McKenzie. Well, let me reassure farmers who are on our farm household allowance, which is not just a drought payment, it's actually for farmers in hardship, uh, we are standing with you. We are not cutting you off. This is a time-limited payment, as also endorsed by the National Farmers Federation's own drought strategy. They also believe uh, that it should be a time-limited payment, which is why we've got this additional response into the ability to uh, create lump sum payments uh, as the drought continues, and we will do that. But if you are a farmer who is, has, has, has been assessed and is ineligible for farm household allowance, despite the changes we're making uh, to off-farm and uh, on-farm income and asset changes, etc., then we do have a loan facility through the RIC uh, of up to $2 million interest-free and repayment free for two years, and then interest only uh, till year five. Order. Which is a Senator McKenzie. Sen Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate about the recent jobs fair held in Western Australia and how these jobs fairs assist Australians into jobs? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan 
Sullivan for his question. And can I also acknowledge uh, the work that Senator O'Sullivan has done prior to coming into this place, and in particular uh, his dedication to getting people off welfare yeah, yeah. and into work. Yeah. Uh, as Senator O'Sullivan uh, stated recently, uh, the Morrison government held a jobs fair uh, in Mandra in Western Australia. Mr President, jobs fairs have been held around Australia, and to date we've had in excess of 20,000 Australians come along and talk with local employers about opportunities for work. The Morrison government is committed to getting people off welfare and into work, and the jobs fairs were a really practical way about making local connections. Local employers are able to come along to the jobs fairs and they are able to advertise the local jobs that they have available. It's all about making face-to-face -face connections. Local people who are looking for work are able to come along, have a look at the jobs board, have a look at what's available, and then go and talk to the specific employer who has the job advertised. Mr. President, this is all about the Morrison government's commitment to ensuring that we are getting Australians off welfare and into work, and we're ensuring that Australians understand where the local jobs are available. Since we were elected to government in 2013, the economy has created now almost 1.5 million jobs. This is because those of us on the Morrison side of the chamber we understand that governments don't create jobs, employers do. We put in place the policy framework under which, under our policies, employers are able to prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. Under this government, we've achieved record participation rates, record full-time employment and record women participating in the workforce. Order. Senator O'Sullivan. Minister, why is it important to help Australians into work? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the best form of welfare is a job. This is something that we fundamentally Order. believe as a government. It is also work that is integral to supporting a strong economy. When a person is able to get a job, when they move from welfare and into work, they are no longer in receipt of social services and they become taxpaying citizens. That is a good thing. But there's also the incalculable other benefits that having a job provides. And that is, of course, when you go and talk to people, talk to people who've been on unemployment benefits and they've made that transition into the workforce. They describe to you the self-esteem, the self-esteem they get because they Order. now have a job, the ability to provide for their family. And more than that, now that they have a job, being able to be a role Order model my for others around them. Mr President, under this government, welfare dependency is the lowest it has been in 30 years. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate of the policy priorities of the Morrison government to continue to support job growth in Australia? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr President. And of course, our plan is to continue putting in place the policies that will ensure a strong economy. Our plan is all about rewarding and building resilience Senator and Watt. rewarding aspiration. Senator Mr Watt. President, lower taxes. It's in our DNA. Why? Because we want Senator Australians Watt, to keep when more I call you of what they to order. earn, more of their hard-earned money. We are also committed on the coalition side of the chamber to reducing the costs of doing business. This, of course, includes deregulation, but also ensuring that small and medium enterprises are paid on time, ensuring that we give Australians the skills that they need and that businesses Senator are telling White us that they need. And of course, the great work done by successive trade ministers, expanding our trade borders to access more markets, because when a small and medium business is able to access another market, they are able to grow their business and create more jobs for Australians. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to Senator Cash, the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business. Senate estimates revealed that 104,480 job seekers and job active participants who had their payments suspended had not re-engaged with Centrelink. That is, they have dropped off the income support system. This includes 12,000 First Nations peoples, nearly 14,000 disabled people and nearly 10,000 homeless people. 50 per cent of the 104,000 were under the age of 30. 
Is the so-called lowest dependency on welfare due to the fact that 104,000 people have disappeared off the system and the department said they didn't know what had happened to them? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Seawitt for her question. And you are correct, Senator Seawitt. Uh, this was explored by you in detail with the department at Senate Estimates. Uh, and to be fair to the department, uh, you are merely paraphrasing part of what their response is to you. In terms of the answer to your question, it is a very simple no. Uh, you and I will disagree, uh, and that is fair enough in relation to the commitment of those of us on this side of the government, and our commitment is to get people off welfare and into work. In that regard, and you know this well, we have made changes to the targeted compliance framework. And it is actually working. Senator Seawood, it is now simpler and easier for job seekers to understand what they need to do, but also to take control of their own personal requirements. It is also providing protection, Mr President, for vulnerable job seekers and those and those who will undertake deliberate and willful non-compliance. Senator Seawatt, you and I have debated this uh, in previous parliaments. Uh, you know that we as a government have put in place safeguards to ensure job seekers are not penalised for failing to meet mutual obligation requirements that are not appropriate to their circumstances. So, Senator Seawatt, the answer to your question is no. On this side of the chamber, we will do everything that we can to get people off welfare and into work, and the changes that we have made to the targeted compliance framework are indeed doing that. Senator Seawood, a supplementary question. Does the government or does it not know what has happened to 104,480 people who have dropped off income support? Does the minister seriously think that a 10,000 homeless people, 14,000 people with disability, and 50 per cent of that cohort are under the age of 50 have all got jobs. Senator Cash. Uh, again, Senator Seawood, this was canvassed in detail by yourself and the departmental officials at Senate Estimates. And what the departmental officials took you through was the process that is undertaken before a person exits the system. And that process involves steps along the way, a number of steps along the way, to ensure that at all times, if there is a barrier to discharging your mutual obligation, Order. that this is taken care of. And if your job plan needs to be adjusted accordingly, it can be. Senator C, what you'll also recall, though, the department stated to you that job seekers whose payments are cancelled are able to reapply for income support at any time. And once they are recommenced, they will receive services and income support as usual. Again, the temporary Order. compliance Senator fra Cash. Senator framework Seward, has made A final made supplementary question. I'll ask again. Does the government know what has happened to the 104,480 job seekers who have dropped off income support? Does they, do they know what's happened to them? Have some of them re-engaged? Have some of them got work? Or, as many people strongly suspect, they have no form of income support or income? Senator Cash. Well, again, Mr President, as the department explained in detail to Senator Seawitt, at Senate, at Senate estimates, there are a number of reasons that a person exits the system. A number of reasons, including that these people have found work. But Senator Seawood, again, what the department explained to you in detail is the process that is gone through with a person, and in particular in the event that they are not able to meet their mutual obligation requirements. Order. Senator Seawood on a point of order. I, the minister is not answering the question of what does the government know what's happened to the 104,000 people. The minister is not answering that question. Senator I've Seward, asked it Senator, so many times. Order. 
On the point of order, Senator Corbyn. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Se Senator Cash is being directly relevant, order. directly relevant to the question. Order. Senator Cash could not be more directly relevant to the question if she tried. Senator Seawood, I remind you, you are making an assertion that is not in the standing orders about the nature of the answer of the question. I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question. I'm only empowered to ensure she is being directly relevant. And I believe the material she's doing is makes it directly relevant. There is an opportunity after question time for debate of the answers that ministers provide. I call the minister to continue. Uh, Senator thank Cash. you, Mr. President. And again, Senator See, what the department explained in detail to you at Senator, at Senate estimates, once a job seeker exits employment services following a payment cancellation, the department is limited, and I think you would understand, due to privacy considerations in its ability to collect information about the job seeker's circumstance. However, they are able Order, to Senator reconnect— Cash. Senator Cormann. Uh, I ask that further questions be placed on the Can I speaker, ask for you. senator's attention for— it was, yeah. Can I ask for senator's attention for one minute? It is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the untimely death on the 9th of November of former Senator Mehmet Tillam, a senator for the state of Victoria from 2013 to 2014, known to many of us through our service with him here. A motion of condolence will be moved in the Senate later this week. Thank you. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator, oh, I beg your pardon, our Minister. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to um, address some of Senator Green's uh, concern uh, and provide an answer on that I took on notice. In re I've received some advice from the Minister uh, in relation to the questions regarding conflict of interest in relation to an application from QRX for a grant under the Regional Jobs and Investment Packages. The Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Cities and Regional Development has answered questions about this application in quite some detail at estimates, and uh, the minister would refer that senator in particular to the hand side of the committee for the 21st of May 2018 uh, and answers to questions provided on notice. Thank you, Minister. Senator Urquhart, so we're back to now uh, uh, answers to questions. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator McKenzie to the questions asked by Senator Green and myself. And can I just first of all start off with saying Senator McKenzie was meant to be representing the Deputy Prime Minister today. The questions that uh, I asked and that uh, Senator Green asked flowed from front pages in the Cairns Post and the Launceston Examiner. Both of these uh, newspapers are fine regional newspapers, yet the Deputy Prime Minister's Office failed to adequately brief the representing senator. So it appears to me that national senators clearly don't follow the regional news. Minister Mackenzie also misled the chamber in her response to my primary question. She said that all information in relation to applications is publicly available online. Well, it is not. So the Deputy Prime Minister's Office needs to properly brief Minister Mackenzie, and then Minister Mackenzie then needs to come in here to the chamber and admit that she misled the chamber on that particular point. Her key talking point was that the critics are cherry picking. No one is cherry picking. The whole Auditor General's report is scathing. Can I just go back to the questions that I asked Senator McKenzie? My very first question was, what evidence did ministers rely upon in awarding the grant? Uh, and the grant that I particularly talked about was the $365,000 for a food van on Flinders Island in Tasmania and the co-funding exemption. The Minister Mackenzie sought to take that on notice. The Auditor uh, Office report said that the department recommended the project but advised the ministerial panel that the applicant supplied limited evidence to support their case. So that's what the Auditor General's report said, that it supplied limited evidence 
to support their case for a co-funding exemption. Of the 233 grants that were awarded nationwide, the Killacranky food van on Flinders Island was one of just four projects that was exempted from a co-funding arrangement. Just four. And if I go back to the Auditor General report, said the department recommended the project, but advised that the ministerial panel that the applicants supplied limited evidence to support their case for that exemption for co-funding. So why is the proponent not even contributing one cent to this project? What does that say about the viability of the enterprise? My second question went to uh, the issue of what steps has the government taken to ensure that that $365,000 for a food van represents value for money. Again, Senator Mackenzie took that question on notice. So my questions would be, did the ministerial panel re-evaluate this application after it was changed? The original application was for a physical cafe and community centre. It was then changed to a food van. So did the ministerial panel re-evaluate the application based on the changed circumstances from a physical cafe, a building and a community centre, to a food van? There's a lot of difference between those two scenarios. How much does a food van cost? The minister should come and answer that. Could it really cost $365,000? It's a lot of money for a caravan on wheels. A lot of money. Is the van being retrofitted in Tasmania? It's another question I would put to the minister. And how many jobs are actually being created in North Flinders Island as a result of this? And how many jobs are actually being created in Tasmania from this $365,000 being spent on a food van? So I would go back to the minister and say, come in here and clear up the discrepancies, but give us a full comprehensive outline of the details around why this particular project does not require the proponent to put one cent in and why, is it, uh, why has it been funded fully by the government through Thank this you, project. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Madam Deputy President, I'm quite happy to rise in this place to defend the government's uh, award of funding under the Regional Jobs and Investment Packages (RGIP). And can I say, I said once before in this place that if the, my good friends opposite refer to a document, always get the document and read what the document says. Always get the original of the document and see what it says. So let me give you some of the recommendations and findings from the Auditor-General's report in relation to ARGI. Recommendation 6. In total, 233 projects were awarded $220.5 million in grant funding across the 10 regions. The grants represent 32 per cent of the estimated total project costs of $688.3 million. Now, that's the first point I want to make, that $220.5 million of grant funding leveraged $688.3 million in total expenditure. That is a good outcome. That is, in fact, a better outcome than what was predicted in the original policy announcement made in 2013 by the then Liberal and National parties that this would leverage only a one-to-one -one basis. It was only expected to leverage an extra $220 million. But in fact, in fact, the total expenditure, $688.3 million. 688.3 million. So this project has in fact been extremely successful, but you wouldn't know it listening to those members opposite. The second recommendation or finding from the Auditor General's report, which of course was not referred to, of course has not been referred to by those opposite, and it will be very interesting to see if it's referred to by those opposite who may speak after me. The other finding was there was no bias clearly evident in the assessment and decision-making processes. Let me say it again. There was no bias clearly evident in the assessment and decision-making processes. 
Decisions to not approve recommended applications occurred in two Queensland regions, my home state of Queensland, at a rate more than three times the average across the other eight regions. These de decisions affected five electorates, each of which was held by the coalition. Each of which was held by the coalition. But you wouldn't know that. You wouldn't know that from listening to those opposite. And one of those projects, if I can refer to one of the great projects that received support under that project funding, and that is the construction of an aged care facility in Mossman. Aged care facility in Mossman. The Salvation Army has just entered into a construction contract for the construction of that facility. And let me tell you that the mayor, the mayor up at Mossman is absolutely delighted. And this is what Mayor Lou said. The start of construction was a huge moment. We are absolutely thrilled that this day has come, she said. The Mossman Aged Care Centre has been a high priority project that the community has been striving to get for more than 23 years. For more than 23 years. And now that project is going to be delivered, delivered in part, delivered in part under regional funding provided under this program. As a senator for Queensland, I say that's a success. That's a success. And as for Senator Green drawing comparisons between the good people of Leichhardt and the good people of Kennedy, let me say, let me say that only a few months ago I attended the opening of an extra wing in a beautiful aged care facility in the lovely town of Tully, in the seat of Kennedy. That was in part funded by Commonwealth government funding, even though it's in the state seat, federal seat of Kennedy. Even though it's in the federal seat of Kennedy, it was funded by the Commonwealth Government. It doesn't matter which bucket of money it comes out of, Senator Green, as long as it's delivered to my constituents in the home state of Queensland, I'll be extremely happy. It doesn't matter which bucket it comes out of, as long as the funds reach my constituents in the state of Queensland, I'll be happy. And Senator Green, I'm very happy to take your interjection, but can I say to you, I do hope. I do hope that if you do get up in this place and speak on this question, you actually address you actually address that finding of the Australian National Audit Office, which says there was no bias evident, no bias evident, no bias evident in the decision-making process under this scheme. Uh, Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Oh. And I'm working off a, um, a speaker's list, Senator no, Hanson. No, it's not. No, it's not. Well, we've got a speaker's list, and um, there's usually time for the crossbench towards the end. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. So and I called Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And the point I'd make, Senator Scar, is this audit report was so good. Why was it released an hour before the Melbourne Cup? If it's so good, why didn't they sort of release it so that everyone could pay attention to it? They tried to bury it, and now before the Melbourne Cup, because they are embarrassed by the rorts it identifies that those opposite have partaken in. That's exactly what it does. Uh, and it is telling that the Deputy Prime Minister um, was hanging out with the inner city lunatics when it was released. He likes to say they're inner city lunatics. Where was he? At the Melbourne Cup. Uh, so he's saying that, uh, on one hand this morning, that. Uh, the inner city lunatics are so out of touch, yet there he is at the Melbourne Cup hanging out with them on the day this audit report was released. But I don't begrudge him having a day off and going to the races. Good luck to him. But he needs to be held accountable for what this report says. And there's a history to these packages because they were announced in the lead up to the 2016 election. And we know in regional parts of Australia, and I know in regional Queensland, there are significant jobs challenges in that part of the state. They announced these packages throughout regional Queensland in the lead up to the 2016 election, yet they sat on them for 12 months. They did not announce the guidelines. They did not spend one cent. They did not create one job for 12 months after that election, and they said, oh, we're working on the guidelines. And then what we find out now, uh, after they sat on it for so long, didn't spend one cent, didn't create one job. Uh, we see the reality of what they created through this audit process that highlights serious problems with this program uh, and the fact that as many as 64 applications that were deemed eligible by the department were rejected and favoured in what could only be called political decision-making to favour their preferred uh, proponents of some of these projects. 
So when that we see the history of these programs and the fact that regional Australians are desperate for jobs, uh, this is the way they are treated by the government. Uh, where they don't take these things seriously, they seek to bury this report on Melbourne Cup Day, uh, while the, the Deputy Prime Minister himself, and you would have to question his judgment after his behaviour over the last couple of weeks, uh, was actually at the Melbourne Cup when this was released. But this project, uh, dreamt up by the National Party, um, has failed to deliver for regional Queenslanders, and that is what the Audit Office uh, identifies today. Uh, and the projects that uh, were deemed uh, supportive throughout regional Queensland, uh, there's been no transparency about why some of those projects were rejected, uh, why decisions were made to favour some projects over others, uh, and a failure to account for how many jobs will be created or how many jobs could have been created if other projects were supported at the expense of the ones the national parties focused on to deliver. Uh, there's no doubt that after winning that election in 2016, uh, this government went into hibernation on these projects. Uh, clearly, they scrambled behind the scenes to try and get guidelines in place uh, that they've then gone about ignoring as part of the process in terms of identifying which projects were going to get funding at the expense of others. And now that it's been exposed, uh, we see sitting members try and justify uh, the projects that were supported. So we've seen that with Ken O'Dowd in Flynn. Uh, we've seen that with Lou O'Brien in Wide Bay as well, uh, where they've tried to highlight some of the projects with, that were supported. But what they haven't done is actually given any justification for the projects that were rejected. Uh, there's been no evidence provided uh, or no correspondence that's been given back to those proponents who put forward proposals that the government's department actually supported and ticked off on, yet were rejected on political grounds. Um, so that is, actually, actively, that is actually what happened as part of this process, that areas throughout regional Queensland uh, that needed projects to be funded, that needed jobs on the ground, that the department said they had ticked the boxes to be approved were rejected through the political process that was set up by those opposite. And it's actually the local chambers of commerce and local business representatives that are the one calling on the government to provide answers. So we've seen that in Bowen, we've seen that in Gladstone, we've also seen that in Gympie as well. So throughout various parts of regional Queensland where these project, this program was supposed to provide regional jobs, uh, we've seen no correspondence We've seen no effort by the government to explain why some projects were rejected. Uh, we, we will absolutely hold them to account because we want to ensure regional Queenslanders get a fair Thank deal. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, it's good to be able to stand here today and talk about uh, what this government is doing to create jobs. Uh, time and time again, uh, those opposite take this opportunity, take this time of taking note of questions and give us again another opportunity to talk about the great record of this government in creating jobs. So I thank those opposite uh, for, for raising uh, this and giving us that opportunity. This particular program, the regional jobs and investment packages, uh, help diversity, uh, diversify sorry, uh, regional economies. It stimulates the economic growth and delivers sustainable employment. Uh, the program is creating thousands of jobs in regional Australia. The Australian government committed $222.3 million of funding in RJIP to help diversify uh, regional economies, stimulate economic growth and deliver sustainable employment. In the first half of 2018, 233 projects across the 10 pilot regions were approved. Projects are expected to create more than 12 thousand local jobs. Now, as the ANAO report acknowledged, for an investment of $220.5 million in grant funding, the program has leveraged an estimated additional $467.8 million in project costs to support projects that drive economic growth in regional Australia. That is a fantastic return that the Australian government has been able to get on behalf of taxpayers in investing that money and creating jobs. But this isn't all that the Australian government is doing. The Liberal National Government have a tremendous record in creating jobs in 
Regional Australia uh, through other programs such as the $841 million investment into building better regional FUDs, which is delivering uh, uh, 832 projects. There's one particular project I'd highlight, uh, which is in uh, the, the very southern part of Western Australia in the town of Esperance. Uh, through this fund, we are enabling the development of the jetty uh, the, the, that's going to allow deep water uh, uh, vessels to be able to come in there. And again, it's creating jobs. There are projects right across regional Australia that we could all point to on this side of the chamber of where the Liberal national government is investing uh, significant sums and great investments that are returning amazing outcomes. Now, we could have asked some questions, uh, could, have, could have taken note of the question that I gave uh, to Senator Cash, where we talked about in another regional part, although it's, a, uh, I guess a, just a, it's very close to uh, a major urban setting, but that's uh, no doubt a, no, nonetheless a, an outer um, uh, urban area, and that's in, the, in my uh, neck of the woods, uh, in, in the, 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 the city of Mandra where we had the jobs fair last, uh, just, uh, just over a week ago. And there were 91 apprenticeships on offer in that job fair. I mean, they, like, apprenticeships are life-changing opportunities for people. And there were 91 apprenticeships that were on offer uh, in that area. And we saw the whole place just filled with people. There were plenty of other jobs there, so many, many hundreds of other jobs that were available. And the place was there. People were optimistic. They were looking forward to it. Now, you only need to go back a few years uh, into Mandarin. You'd know that uh, there have been significant and high levels of youth unemployment, but there are, uh, the, 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 the ship is, is turning. There is a significant change that's happening there, and there's optimism. People are looking forward to the opportunities that, that have been created in this economy. Over 300,000 additional jobs have been created in this financial year already alone, 2018-19, beg your pardon, last year. Uh, that's a, a growth of 2.6 per cent. Now, these are big numbers, but it represents families. It represents individuals that have been able to get ahead, make a better life for themselves and their families, and it, it is a significant impact upon their life. So this government has a tremendous record when it comes to creating jobs, and particularly in regional areas. The National Stronger Regions Fund is a $611 million program that's delivering 225 projects. The $272 million uh, uh, program of a Regional Growth Fund, which is delivering 17 projects. And there's over $157 million, which is going, importantly, to the Drought Communities Program, which is delivering 489 projects across this Australia. Uh, thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I, I rise to take note of the questions, um, uh, the answers provided by Senator McKenzie to my questions about the regional jobs and investment package, and the audit by the Australian National Office Audit Office, which was scathing, scathing of the processes conducted by this government. This government blocked recommendations made by the department and instead handed out grants to projects not approved, not considered on the basis of value for money or how many jobs they were delivered, but approved by this government because they were in a marginal Liberal held seat. Now, I know, well, I'm, I'm really pleased that the um, gentlemen opposite have, have stayed to hear a little bit more about what's in the report, because I know they want to quote one little section of it. But here we've got some other things that were found in the report that I think they might be interested in hearing about. Um, the audit office also found that they approved an uh, ineligible application for funding. An ineligible application. They approved five late applications for funding with no exemption re reasons recorded. They failed to verify claims around ongoing jobs created for each proposed grant. They did not rescore provide reasons when rejecting 28 per cent of applications recommended by the department. They approved 17 per cent of applications not recommended by the department without adequate reasons. They failed to appropriately consider co-funding exemptions, awarding four applications a total of $1.74 million without any private co-investment. Now, we're not standing here trying to say that this investment in regional areas, in regional Queensland, is a bad 
thing. And we're certainly not trying to say that the projects that receive this funding didn't deserve the funding or need the funding. But what we are here trying to ask and find out the answers to is why was this process, why was this process so skewed by ministerial intervention to lead to a situation where one electorate received 89 per cent of the funding pool? I also want to ask um, an answer to the question that I asked Senator McKenzie about the, you know, the statement that was made to the Cairns Post, and um, Senator Urquhart did refer to those uh, uh, process, those announcements in the Cairns Post and um, and in Tasmania, and it is a surprise that she wasn't able to answer that question today. But I asked her about the process conducted by the department, and in the Cairns Post on Saturday, a statement from the member for Leichhardt, Warren Encher's office, said. Um, it said that they had uh, been decided by the department, that these decisions had been decided by the department. Well, we, just, we know that's not true. We know that that is a misleading statement. The department didn't agree with the statement, of course, and told the Cairns Post that this was an issue for the government to answer. So we've come here today looking for that answer, and of course we haven't received it. We know that the ministerial panel, including the Deputy Prime Minister, was responsible for assessing and awarding grants. The statement by the member for Leichhardt's office is completely misleading. Why is the member for Leichhardt's office giving misleading statements to the Cairns Post? Well, perhaps it's because 12 months ago the Cairns Post broke a story about a $2.4 million grant being awarded under an extreme cloud of conflict of interest. I would want to avoid uh, front pages like this as well if I was in the government. But let me be clear. We, on people on this side, we do support investment in regional Queensland. We want these jobs to flow and these projects to get off, a, off the ground. But surely questions must be answered when the member for Leichhardt's office is giving misleading statements to the Cairns Post, when 89 per cent of a funding pool goes to an electorate, when we know that the tropical North Queensland is a region that covers two electorates. These are questions that need to be answered. And I would be happy if this minister would come in here and answer these questions, would make this information public, would tell us which projects missed out, would tell us what has happened to the $2.4 million for QRX Group 1. Uh, all they need to do is release this information, but they won't do that because we know that this is a rort for regional votes. While parts of regional Queensland missed out, while parts of Kennedy missed out, and the jobs that this investment was meant to create go wanting in a place that needs them more than anywhere else, one job was protected, and that was the job for the member for Leichhardt. Thank you, Senator Green. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the, I can't really call them answers, but to the, uh, I certainly posed some questions to Minister Mackenzie representing the Minister for Natural Disasters and Emergency Management. So I rise to take note of the response. Perhaps we can generously call it that. Um, now I asked Senator, Senator Mackenzie about the outlandish claims made by her leader, the Nationals leader and the Deputy Prime Minister of this nation, Michael McCormack, on national radio this morning, where he, in a somewhat un unhinged manner, if you can pardon my uh, description, described people who were concerned about climate change as raving inner city lunatics. Now, I put to the minister, does that describe the 11,000 climate scientists that last week begged this government for action on the climate crisis? Does that describe uh, one of the mayors of the regional areas that has been hit by these unprecedented and catastrophic bushfires over the weekend? Does that describe the, the rural fire service captains who likewise are making the link between the climate emergency and these absolutely destructive bushfires? And of course, I ask whether that description describes the actual survivors of these bushfires who are also making the link between the climate emergency and these bushfires. And, um, the minister, perhaps it's a bit awkward for her, she can't really throw her own leader under the bus, but she maintained that she in fact accepted the science. 
well, perhaps she needs to have a few more discussions in her party room because it's very clear that the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr Michael McCormack, thinks that climate science is only the province of raving inner-city lunatics. There's been much commentary about this today, and I'm not going to stoop to name-calling, but I would urge the minister, um, the minister she's representing and her own leader, Mr McCormack, to refresh themselves on the climate science. It, there is no shortage of experts who are making the link and begging this government to do the same. And in fact, that was the next point I put to the minister. There was a request for a meeting some months ago by over 20 former fire chiefs and fire experts that had written to uh, the Prime Minister himself as well as to the uh, Minister for uh, Natural Disasters and Emergency Management seeking a meeting, wishing to brief our national government on the dangers of the climate emergency, on preparedness for bushfire risk, on how to reduce that risk um, and on what we can expect if this government continues to do nothing about the climate crisis. But surprise, surprise, they didn't get the meeting that they sought. And in fact, this morning, uh, Minister McCormack was quite dismissive, I thought insulting, of that group of 20 former fire chiefs. Um, and he somehow asserted that they were a front group or sometimes front groups sought meetings with him and it was all very suspicious. He wasn't sure who he was meant to be meeting with. What an embarrassment when those actual fire experts want to grace this government with their expertise and are desperate for some genuine climate action and instead they get not only fobbed off with their meeting request refused but they then get insulted on national radio by the deputy prime minister of this nation. Unfortunately, the minister representing um, in the Senate here today didn't have a good answer for that, and again, maybe that's because her leader has well and truly put his foot in it, um, and she felt a bit awkward about calling that out. But nonetheless, this is question time, and sadly, um, there's a reason it's called question time and not answer time. Um, the last point that I put to the minister was that Australian climate scientists, who are world-renowned, world do amazing work, have since 2006 been warning of the increased fire risk from the climate emergency. Bomb and Syro in 2006 gave a report to then Prime Minister John Howard. Um, it was ignored, but we can't say we didn't see this coming and we can't say that this government hasn't had to hand advice from experts on how to reduce the severity and the destructiveness of the force of these fires. It's by taking action on the climate crisis and instead all we hear from this government are that they're sending thoughts and prayers to people who've just had their homes burnt, to people who've just lost members of their family. That does not cut it, folks. You're meant to be running this country and you don't even have the dignity or the humility to take advice from experts on how to reduce fire risk and keep people safe. Surely that is the first job of government, to keep the community safe and to listen to advice from experts. Well, that hasn't happened in this instance, and the government continues to maintain that they're somehow acting on, on uh, the climate when we know that we are the world's largest per capita emitter. And even if this government's pathetic targets were met, we would still be the world's largest per capita emitter. It is time to wake up, give the dirty donations back from coal, oil and gas, and take action to protect us from the Thank apocalypse you, Senator that's coming. Waters, your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Waters to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move